I'm first and foremost a, a doctor. I come from a medical family. Um, my father was a GP. My older sister is a community paediatrician, just retired. Um, my younger brother is also a GP, but now leading a clinical commissioning group. Um, so perhaps surprisingly, it took me till I'd been at university a year even to work out that I might want to be a doctor. Um, but I've had very happy career as a doctor, 25 years working in general medicine and then in cancer medicine, then palliative medicine. Um, and then in 1999, I moved to the Department of Health as the first national cancer director, uh, really responsible for trying to bring about a drive and change in cancer services because we knew we were lagging behind in this country. Remember that I don't know a huge amount about the previous uh, processes, but I do know that they were based around the essential standards. And I think part of the difficulty there was basing it around an individual standard or even a group of standards um, doesn't really allow you to look at the whole care pathway for a patient. Um, and what I'm hoping to do is to say, let's take the emergency pathway from the time a person comes to A&E, moves through A&E to uh, the emergency assessment unit or the emergency medical unit, whatever it may be called, then onto a general ward, then maybe onto a ward for the frail elderly. Follow the patient through that pathway and see is the care delivered at each step in that pathway really working? Because I think often it can be the handovers between uh, different parts of, of a pathway that, that f fail. So for example, um, how well does a hospital look after patients who are deteriorating? Um, and how well do they do that out of hours at a weekend? Um, and do they have the systems in place for early warnings, for escalation, uh, who's there, do they have the right critical care outreach service, whatever it may be. And I think we can uh, then look across a pathway. And of course, actually within that, the essential standards will still remain important. We still need to check that people are getting uh, food and water. Um, and so all of those things will remain important, but it'll be doing it in a different way and with more uh, clinical involvement alongside professional inspectors. Well, we thought long and hard about this, um, about where, sh where we should go first. One of the key things I want to do is to test out our new surveillance tool. Uh, as people will know, um, we're out to consultation on this at the moment, and we've set out all the, the metrics in Annex A of the, the consultation document, and I hope people are reading that and will comment on it. But we've got a very good start there. So we've got a number of indicators for each of the five domains of safety, effectiveness, caring, responsiveness, and being well-led. Um, and those metrics hopefully will allow us to, to identify trusts that are at higher risk or at lower risk. Now we need to test that, but we think we've got enough there. So we've chosen six trusts that are apparently high risk, mm -hmm. six that are apparently low risk, and six that f come in the range in between, and they cover just about all, uh, everything in between. Um, and this will really help us to know what the range of quality of care is in this country. Um, and. I think that therefore by Christmas when we complete this wave, we will know much more about our surveillance tool, we will know much more about our inspection uh, programme and we'll know about the first 18 trusts that we've looked at. So I think that's where we need to go and after all we are committed that by December 2015 we will have done all acute trusts in this country. We are committed to having patient and public listening events for each of our comprehensive inspections. Whether those are on site at the hospital, whether they are off site in the local town hall, I don't think that matters. What we need to do is to give people an opportunity ahead of the programme, either to come to a, a listening event uh, by advertising it in the local press or to send us their comments in advance. We've got to gather that information together. That's an incredibly important part of the preparation phase. And the, you know, if we get the preparation for these inspections right, we get all the views. So it's the views from patients and the public, but it's also the views from Health Watch, from uh, NHS England, from CCGs, from Health and Wellbeing Boards, the lot. We'll want to bring all that in, so that, because that will help us to know when we go in, what are we really looking for? Mm -hmm. And that will technically, that will make us look at our key lines of inquiry and so that we know what to pursue. 
I hope we respond very quickly. Whether we respond more quickly, I don't know, because I really don't know how quickly we've been responding in the past. But yes, we must be responsive. Uh, with our surveillance tool, it's, it, this is not just going to be a once a year business. We've got to keep that uh, on a rolling basis of keeping it up to date, which we will do. When there are signals that come in saying, we're worried about such and such a trust. We need to be able to respond to that. And remember, that in addition to our comprehensive or scheduled program of these major visits, we will still be doing responsive visits. So if there is a concern about the paediatric service at a particular hospital, of course we will go in there um, not waiting for its turn in the cycle of um, comprehensive inspections. If that visit about paediatrics makes us concerned maybe this is a, there's a wider problem in this trust, that will trigger us to bring forward the comprehensive inspection. So I think we've got to be flexible, but we certainly will need to still be able to have responsive uh, inspections as well as these comprehensive ones. With our inspections, I am planning that we will have focus groups during these inspections. But I think one's quite uh, important is to have focus groups of different staff groups. So staff nurses, but staff nurses without matron watching them, um, or junior doctors without the consultants who may have some control of their future career uh, watching them. And I think particularly if we involve junior doctors as part of our panels, I think they can go and be holding a focus group with junior doctors. My experience from the Keogh review is that we find a lot out that way. Um, so I think we've got to create those safe environments that people can tell us what it's, what it's like and that people can tell us the good points as well.